glory to God, it's Sunday. Come on. Aren't you glad that Jesus is Lord? Huh? Praise God. Now, if you're dead, we're going to resurrect you today. Okay? Because we are not having, you know, a dead service. All right? You say, how come, Pastor? Because I don't like them. Once you get set free, praise God, you're free indeed, right? So you're going to have to get a little bit more excited, I think, than what I've witnessed up to this point. Jesus is here. And if he's here, we need to honor him. Amen. Did you all bring your Bibles with you this morning? Let's open our Bibles to the book of uh, John, John's Gospel. And um, we're going to take off from there. John chapter 10, if you can find that opening in your Bibles. <clears throat> Again, we want to welcome all of you this morning, especially those of you that are watching by internet. Delighted you can be with us here today, praise God. So hope you'll get your Bible as well, and let's, uh, let's behold some wonderful things from his word, amen? And then um, as, we, uh, as we move along in the service today, uh, I want us just to be more um, attentive uh, to what it is the Spirit of God is, is saying to us, to our hearts, to you. And the reason I say that is, is because there's so many d- distractions in life. You know, we got all this going on, this and that and the other, and options and, you know, things and whatever. And for just a few moments, I want us just to forget about all of that and really focus on Him. Amen? Because I believe that God wants to do something in every one of our lives. The Bible talks about us moving from faith to faith and from glory to glory. In other words, that, that's indicative of an improvement. Okay? And, um, and he wants to do that for every one of us. Amen. So let's not let the service just be a, a, a redundant kind of thing. Well, you know, I went to church this week. Uh, there's so much more to it than that. And uh, we want to get everything we can from heaven as we move forward in his plan and purpose for our lives. I also want to thank all of you that came last Sunday night, prayed with us for the nation, and also for the church. Had a great um, Uh, time together in prayer. God gave us some really uh, wonderful utterance as we uh, lift up again the nation and the church. We'll be doing that again, uh, perhaps, and I say perhaps, but uh, plenty, maybe the the 29th of this month on a Sunday night at six. So if you want want to, you can uh, put that down in your calendar uh, because the reality is, is that uh, prayer is what changes everything. And you can look in the Old Testament and even in the New uh, where men and women, uh, people uh, that feared God, uh, set themselves to pray and and looked to God uh, for the needs that they had within uh, their life, their nation, the people that, you know, so on and so forth. And God moved. And I can tell you right now, God's the only answer to this whole mess. Are you listening to me? And so, uh, uh, of course, we can uh, we can look to him, praise God and and know we'll be blessed. So again, thank you for joining with us in that. One more thing I might mention to you uh, would be of value is, you know, you don't have to wait till the 29th to pray. I know that's a news flash, but you know, the, re- <clears throat> the reality is, is uh, you could get a couple of your friends that know how to pray. Maybe they don't even know how to pray. I guess it doesn't matter, but you know, <clears throat> uh, just get together and uh, pray uh, for the For the nation, you might be surprised what God might, you know, use you for and flow through you to accomplish. Amen. You know, the scripture says, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, of course, that I will heal their land. And our land needs a healing. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I was talking with a a person even yesterday and uh, and he was a person of color, and we got to, uh, I didn't, first time I ever met him, didn't know much about him or anything of that nature. So as our conversation kind of moved on, I finally, you know, I just said, so tell me about, you know, your perspective on all of this and, you know, with regard to race and that. He says, well, he says, since I'll never see you again, he says, I'm going to give you the straight shot. And I said, that's great. You know, let me, let, let, let me have it, you know. And... Uh, <clears throat> The, the kind of the, the um, broad stroke of the brush was, in his opinion, that it's not about people, 
It's about the system. They may, you know, they make reference to the system. And uh, not every system, well, there's no perfect system. And certainly there are matters in all of that that maybe need some fix and repair and maybe a bit broken and things of that nature. But he gave some examples of, you know, his life and, you know, how that is detrimental. But we had an incredibly great conversation, you know. It's too bad we can't have more conversation instead of a bunch of fighting. Yeah. You know, you know this is all set on fire of hell, don't you? Yes. You know, the whole principle of divide and conquer is at work mightily. And it is intended to create hate. You know, that's why, you know, when Jesus, well, actually, Paul was talking about in the last days that, you know, <clears throat> people would become lovers of themselves, haters. It says that. It's in the Bible. Haters, you know. And, um, and things of that nature, and, and that the love of many would grow cold. And um, uh, I've always said it, keep saying it, just because the love of many might grow cold doesn't mean yours has to. But you do have to tend and mind your business in those moments, you know, to return, not to return evil for evil, you know, and things of that nature. So anyway, we're, we're living in some exciting times. And, um, you know, Jesus is coming again. So let's not go bury our talent in the backyard. Praise God, let's get it out there and, and let's use it until he comes. Amen? Amen. Praise God. All right, let's, uh, you know what, I'm going to make you get up. Stand up. You say, well, Pastor, I don't like you very much. Well, you, hopefully it'll get better. You get way too comfortable, we'll spend, all these money, spend all this money on these pews so that you're backsides would be so like whatever and well anyway uh, you all right let's pray father today is a great day and we are so ever grateful father god for you and all that you have done father god into this present hour to give us the life that we have and god i'm grateful for these people and even many that are gone from us today father god because of uh you know, getting in the vacations that they need to have before, Father, we get back into a rhythm. But we pray, I pray for them, Father, that today as we break the bread of life, as we look into the perfect law of liberty, that grace will rest upon each and every one of us and that we'll have eyes to see and ears to hear and more importantly, Father, hearts to believe. And so, God, we just thank you for your mercy and goodness in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Bless you. I apologize for uh, the crackling of my voice. I've been uh, having a great time letting the devil know that he is under my feet this past week. And uh, so, Amen. If you think this is bad, you should have heard me earlier. <laughs> John chapter 10. And verse 10, familiar portion of Scripture, Jesus is speaking, hallelujah. You say, how do you know that? Well, because in some Bibles it's written in red, amen. So we know. But this is what Jesus said. Let's look at verse 9. I like it. Praise God. He said, I am the door. Glory to God. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I am come. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. A lot of people are confused about the will of God, and it's really unfortunate because God's given us his word. He's given us the Bible so that we can know his will for our life. And he just made it very clear and apparent and as plain as you can get that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Life as God knows it. Zoe is the Greek word for the word life here. <clears throat> it means not only a duration of time, but it also makes reference to a quality of life. Life as God knows it. Hallelujah. And I tell you what, I got I to gotta believe that uh, the life that God has is pretty good. Amen. No problems, no fear, you know, no hopelessness, 
none of those things. And Jesus came so that you and I could have that kind of life. How many of you believe that this morning? Of course, you know, with that, there's always obstacles, you know, that stand in the way between the will of God and what it is maybe that we're experiencing. So today I want to talk to you about God's, not only his ability, but his desire. You know, God has desires for you. You know, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Uh, the New International says, I know the plans I have for you. Did you know that God has some plans for you? You say, well, what are they? Well, he said, to get, he said plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope, and to give you a future. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you believe that? Huh? Now, again, that may not be your experience, but we're just talking about what God said. Jesus said, I came so that you could have life. God said, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and give you a future. Hallelujah. Now, none of that will be a reality in a person's life if, in fact, you don't choose to believe it. A lot of times people, because of uh, circumstance, uh, experience, um, you know, different things that have gone on in their lives in a negative kind of way, will very often uh, contest what it is that I just got done talking to you about. And certainly the things that we experience in life, they are absolutely real and they can be extremely painful. But I tell you, the important thing for you to understand is, is that there is a God in heaven right. that sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he could redeem you. Hallelujah. You know, God is able to redeem. There are some things you can't turn around, but there are things that God can do to bless your future. Are you with me? But it requires your, call it cooperation. It's a bit more than that. <clears throat> it's really about you fully yielding your heart to him so that he can take whatever's messed up and fix it. How many of you know he likes to fix stuff? Huh? Thank God. And so, again, I want to talk to you about his ability and desire, you know, to fix broken stuff. You know, maybe you're here this morning and maybe your life's broken. You know, God wants to fix it. Well, I sure wish I could believe that. Well, you can. Come on. You know? You know? Uh, sometimes you got to wade through about neck deep unbelief in order to get to a place where a person will actually start maybe thinking about the possibility that God really does want to do something in their life. And you say, well, how do you get there? Well, you just got to keep talking to him about what he said. You know, Jesus went to his own hometown, you know, and um, he spoke with authority. I, I, I was just talking to Joan about this. I said, if Jesus came to our church and preached and you didn't know he was Jesus, he'd probably make a bunch of you mad. <laughs> you say, is that possible? Oh, yeah, 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 because religious people don't like being, uh, you know, called out. You say, am I religious? I don't know. I didn't name any names. I'm just saying that there's stuff he could probably say that you would be offended in. He went to his own hometown, and everybody knew who he was, you know, and so he said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country amongst his own countrymen. In other words, uh, they couldn't get past the fact they knew who he was. You know, and they said, well, you know... <laughs> They said, well, his brothers are here, his sisters are here. We know that he had, you know, six or seven uh, at least siblings, you know, to go along with him. But the Bible says that he could there do no mighty work, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and, and healed them. And the Bible, he, it didn't say he wouldn't, he said he, he couldn't. And the Bible says also the reason was is because of their unbelief. It's a dangerous thing, man. Praise God. Everybody say it together. Thank God. Thank God. I'm, a I'm a believer, not a doubter. Not a doubter. Yeah, amen. Praise God. You might be surprised sometimes, you know, when you examine things a little bit about how much you, uh, you might have more hesitancy in your faith than what you, you think. Yeah. But that's okay. We're all on this journey together, right? We're all heading in a direction for a purpose and a plan that God has for us. But you know what? Praise God. Let's not wait forever to get the job done. Let's, let's, let's pick it up. Hallelujah. I remember when I was a kid in high school, you know, and um, I don't know about you, but I, I, people that run, 
I, I don't understand them. Runners? It's like, why do you want to do that, dude? It's painful. Yeah, I got a son-in-law. Yeah, I just ran five miles, you know. Yeah, well, you're crazy too, but you know. <clears throat> yeah, I don't get that. And so when I was a kid in high school growing up, uh, you know, I wasn't really built to be a runner in the first place. And so they kind of had to find a place for me. And so they ended up, you know, making me run a 400 meter or a 440 back then, it was yards then. And I said, it's, it, is the, it is the worst, man. It is the worst. <laughs> you know, the only thing that makes it worse is if you put hurdles in that 400 meters. <laughs> Now, I never did get into that. Greg was a hurdler, 400 meter, my son Greg, and, and uh, he'd just puke every time he got done. So if that tells you anything about this race, you know, yeah. Um, you say, where are you going with this, Pastor? You know, I'm really not sure anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. I guess I was talking about the fact that some things that you deal with are, they can be painful. But you know, on the other hand, sometimes you just have to deal with it and go for it. So that you can come out on the other side victorious, amen? And we did win some track meets, praise God, but you know, you have to go through it. God's ability and his desire to rebuild and restore your life. And people do need, you know, I don't know if you realize this or not, but people's lives are messed up. They, they have no moral compass, so they don't know what's right or wrong when it comes to morality. Nothing's absolute. People are mixed up about their identity as to who they are, you know, from a sexual standpoint. I'm, I'm really, I think it's so sad that sexuality is what determines who you are in terms of your identity because it's such... Uh, uh, um, I wouldn't say insignificant thing, but it is not the priority of your life, and yet people have made it that. Are you with me? And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. It really is. And there are other things, you know, that are going on in people's lives, you know, that their lives are being wrecked through drugs and alcohol and, you know, what they want and, you know, fulfilling their desires, whatever they might be. And um, it's really, it's not only is it painful to them, but it's painful to watch. When you think about the fact that Jesus came so that they wouldn't have to experience that in their life. The devil is a liar. And he will tell you that what it is that you're, you know, chasing after is the answer to your happiness or fulfillment or your meaning in life. But if it if it's outside the parameters of God's plan, purpose, and the way in which he has given us instruction to live, I got news for you, you'll be disappointed. Are you with me? So we have to choose to obey God and follow him in the way that he would have us to go. You know, he says that we are to come out of the darkness and walk in the light. Isn't that right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Now, having said that, of course, sometimes, you know, people, um, uh, we don't always um, succeed the first time. Sometimes we have some setbacks, but thank God you get to use those from, as stepping stones to get where you want to go. Isn't that right? And... Um, so I just want to talk to you a little bit. I've got all kinds of things in my head here about what I want to talk to you about as far as his ability to redeem and restore. But I guess the reason I bring this up is, is I've been more and more engaged in people within the world and I understand and I see how broken and messed up their lives are. And God wants to fix them. And the only way that can be done is if they're introduced to Jesus and they choose to follow him obey him, okay? Now that's the simple answer <clears throat> to the gospel, but that's the truth, and he does. You know, people, like I said, you know, there's all kinds of people living in unhealthy relationships, and I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're um, uh, 
crude or wrong or anything like that. I'm just saying that they're not healthy. There's not a wholesomeness to the relationship uh, because of things that they say to one another or things that they maybe do to each other or don't say or, you know, all of these different kinds of things. So, so the, 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 the relationship can become very caustic. It, it can be very problematic. Um, and, and that's not the way that God intended for our lives to be. How many of you believe that? You know, he said, I came so that you would have life and life more abundant. But, there, but, the, but the relationship, as I said, is unhealthy. But thank God, you know, how many of you remember Brill Cream? Yep. How many of you don't even have a clue what I'm talking about? Okay, well, the younger people got, you know, are lost. Brill Cream was this stuff you could buy, and most people, they, they, they cut their hair and they, like a butch, you know, real short and whatever. <laughs> so you could take this stuff, smeared on your head and, you know, kind of pour it down this way and then flip it back up and it turn rock hard and stay there, you know, real cream. And so the whole commercial, you say, why are you bringing this up? Because the little jingle that they had is a little dab will do you. Huh? And I tell you, a little dab of Jesus will do you too. And if you like, praise God, you can have a whole lot of Jesus. Amen? But my point is, is that just the, the, the least influence of Jesus in your life can bring about change and turn your, your situation around That's right. if we just open up to him. But you know, I mean, people are broke and busted. You know, they, they drink their, their paychecks. You know, uh, they, they work a job. They get some money. You never see them again until they're broke and busted again. That's no way to live. I said, that's no way to live. You say, well, well, I don't do that. Good for you. You can rejoice. But I tell you, there's a whole host of humanity. That's exactly what they're doing. They, they don't have a life. They just exist. And they're broke, busted. They got this yoke of debt hanging around their head. They were talking about, I, I don't remember what the deal is, but during this whole COVID thing, you know, people have racked it up, baby, on their credit cards, you know, because... You know, I guess spending money makes you feel good. Yeah, matter of fact, it does. But anyway, <clears throat> they've, they've got to the point where, you know, now here, you know, I, unless you're thinking somebody's going to forgive it, here you are. And you're paying interest like it's crazy. That's a yoke. That's not what Jesus intended. Amen? Are you listening to me? But it's happening. People, you know, they wreck their lives with drugs and alcohol. I came out of a drug and alcohol and culture. I know all about it. You know, when they started legalizing smoking dope, I thought, you have got to be kidding me. You know? Because it, it'll, it's, it destroys people's lives. And you know why they legalized it? Because of the revenue. Right. They don't care about the people and the effect that it has all they care about is the money. It's so foolish. Well, you know, people ought to be able to make their own choices. Well, yeah, I guess I'd go along with that. But you know, you don't have to pave the highway to hell. Are you with me? And that's what they're doing, you know. I, this is going to get better. So just hang in there, okay? I got some answers. But people are consumed by, they're, they're, we're talking about unhealthy things that God wants to restore and fix and, and, and make right in your life. But there's a lot of people that are running around, you know, with, with um, you know, being consumed with bitterness and unforgiveness um, um, with regard to their, their past, People have chronic uh, illnesses and sicknesses with, with seemingly no solutions. People will run around without a, with, with an absence of hope. They commiserate over their past failures. They regret the neglected opportunities that they didn't take advantage of. They talk about their pain and the suffering that they are going through or in because of loss. They talk about um, just separation. They talk about the lack and insufficiency in their life. And the list goes on and on. But here's the thing. People, Jesus came to care for all of it. 
And, and it is not as difficult as what people think. You know, people, they look at their lives, and I mean, they've been looking at it for so long, and it's such a mess that they're thinking, man, hey, nobody can put Humpty Dumpty back together here. Well, God can. I'm telling you, he can. And, and you know, here's the thing you need to realize. Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, came to deliver humanity out from under what I just described. And the list is long. But I'm telling you, God is able praise God, to save and deliver those who will call on him. Hallelujah. No matter where you're at, sinner or saint, you know, your station doesn't, is not the issue. Your heart is the issue. I mean, you want life and life more abundant as Jesus promised, then he offers it to you. But you do have to obey him. You have to believe what he said is true. You can't go your own way and say, well, I think I'll try this and then decide whether or not what Jesus said is. Listen, it's true. You can go to the bank that what God said about your life and how to live it is absolutely true. And he'll honor you because you do believe him. Praise God. But we redeem, we've been redeemed out from underneath the curse and a lot of folk don't know it. You know, in Galatians 3 and 13, it says Christ has, everybody say has. has, not going to, he has redeemed us. So, you know, praise God, when you're going down the road of life and things aren't going quite the way you feel they should because it's not in line with the word, you just, you know, praise God, tune her up and say, thank you, Lord, you have redeemed me from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. You're not going to, you have. What are you doing? You're declaring what it is he's done and not what it is that you're seeing. Are you with me? Because we walk by faith and not by what? Sight. And when you begin to believe and speak and declare what it is that God has done for and in your life, things will begin to change. Now, of course, you have to cooperate as well. I mean, you got to get in line with what it is that he's asking you to do, but that's the way it works. And so I was talking to you about this remedy. It's pretty simple. You know, people say, oh, I, I have such a messed up thing. Listen, in about three and a half minutes, I'm going to give you all the answers you need. Ooh, come on now. You think that's possible? Well, we'll see. Simple remedy, three things. One, surrender your heart to him. Now, this is the important word, fully, completely. That's the, one, that's the first thing. Maybe the most important, I don't know. Number two, discover what it is that he has promised to give you through his word. Surrender your heart to him fully. Discover what it is he's promised to give you through his word. That's the way you find out. And number three, forsake everything else and walk down the path that he's chosen for you. That's it. It's all I got. You say, will it work? Absolutely it'll work. So surrender your heart to him fully. Discover what he's promised to give you through his word. Forsake everything else and walk down the path that he has chosen for you. Let's just unpack that a little bit. Would you be all right with that if we took a few minutes? Let's talk about surrendering your heart to him fully. Now, this is key, okay? Because when I was 19, maybe 18, people were pitching me the gospel about my needing to get born again and give my heart to Christ, okay? Okay? But you know, um, in doing that, I'm going to have to surrender. Everybody say surrender. surrender. I'm going to have to surrender my heart to him. This is the way it works, okay? A lot of people have religion, and they're dead, and they don't know God from Adam. They have a form of godliness, but there's no power transforming and changing their life. And they think, by golly, you know, I'm the you know, greatest thing since sliced cheese because I go to church and I'm a member and I've been baptized in water or whatever else, you know, that they have, you know, that makes them feel good about who they are. 
But if you don't genuinely and, and authentically know Jesus in a relationship, you know, because you have, you have, you know, intentionally and deliberately surrendered your life to him and recognize that you're a sinner in need of a savior, then my friend, you're going to be wildly disappointed when you enter into eternity. Because good works don't get you into heaven. But by grace, through faith, you can. So when I say fully surrendering to him, you know, fully, like I said, in my own experience, people were telling me, you know, you need to give your heart. Jesus has a plan for your life. He, he, he loves you. Any of you ever heard these terms? You know, he has a plan for your life. He loves you. He, you know, he wants, you know, to save you. And people will hear it. Huh? I heard it. And you know what? I knew that what they were saying was true. Okay? But here's the catch. I had to give him all of my heart, all of my soul, and all my mind. And I walked the aisle I'd say maybe two or three times, you know, had an altar call, walked the aisle. But you know what? I didn't give him my heart. I went through the motion, but I didn't give it to him. Am I in the right house? You know, I went back to wherever it was I was seated or standing or whatever the case might be, and I was the same Mikey that came down in the first place. So it's this struggle that goes on in every person's life. You know, of knowing, yes, I need to do this, but if I do this, then that means that my life is no longer my own. That means that I have to say, not my will, but your will be done. That's real. Huh? And so through all of those different times, I wasn't willing. I mean, if you really get down to where the rubber meets the road, you know, when it comes to our lives and our relationship with God, he said, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. So I played the game, you know, but nothing changed on the inside of me until a lot of other things happened, and I won't go into all of that, but, you know, I got into a Bible study, and the Word of God, everybody say, thank God for His Word. See, we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abides forever. The word of God is a living thing. If you want to help somebody, give them the word. The same person I was talking to you as a person of color, I shared my testimony with him, you know. And so I sowed seed into the guy's life. Now, I would have liked to have gotten him to a place of decision, but it wasn't the environment for that to happen. But I sowed seed. And I believe that seed will, as it's planted, will bring forth fruit somehow or another. You know, some other laborer can come along and say, you know, he's got it right. You know, we need to, you know, whatever. But that's 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 what gets sketchy in people's lives is is that they they shuck and they jive God. I know none of you have ever done that before. Okay, so I'm really not, you know, making reference to you, but but I did. Until I came to the place of realizing that there was really no way that I could have the life that he wanted me to have unless I completely gave my heart to him. And people know when they do, and people know when they don't, you know? You can take a hog, pig, whatever, you can get him out of the pen, you know, put a little, you know, uh, what do you call it? Harness or something like that on him. Pull him over, you know, there to the, the water hydrant. You can get a bunch of soap and, you know, whatever it is that you want to use. And you can scrub him up and make him, you know, all wonderful and clean. Put a little bow there, you know, on both ears or whatever it is, you know, you, you like to do. And uh, he'll be looking fine. Probably polish his, you know, hooves, make him look good. But here's the fact. 
When you let him go, he's going right back where he came from. Why? Because his nature is that of a pig, right? That don't change. You can do all kind of thing on the outside, you know, but God deals with our hearts. Y'all glad you came today? We're talking about fully, you know, surrendering your heart to him fully. That's the key. You got problems in your life? God wants to fix them, man. And he will when you, when you turn it over to him. You say, God, I'm through with my plan. I'm through with what I think. I'm through with, you know, how I want to do this deal. And you just tell me what to do and I'll make it happen. Mind the right house. So I'm driving down the road on L34 up north of BB Town one night. And I'm going around the corner there by the old tree farm. And I said, God, I don't even know if you're out there, but if you are. Now, that's, that doesn't sound like a lot of faith. But, you know, when I say, God, I don't know whether you're out there or not, the fact is, he's out there. Yep. Okay? So I said, so if you are, which he is, I said, I want you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. And he knew that what I said, I meant. And he met me. So when you have problems in your life, and problems will come. You know, the thing of it is, is that I'd rather face problems you know, in companionship and relationship with God than I would face problems and things that are going on in this life without him. You know? But that's a requirement. You know, sometimes we just try to, you know, give people a 22-minute sermon and, you know, think everything's going to be wonderful. But, you know, the reality is until you get people to a place where they repent, nothing Nothing changes. So, surrendering your heart to him fully is what needs to happen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You say, well, what's that look? I I got another example for you. You know, when it comes to your having offended your husband, wife, or a family member, and you apologize because you know you need to, not because you're really sorry. None of you have ever done that before? Well, then you, you probably can't even relate to what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. That's the difference. You know when, there's an, when it is authentic and genuine, honey, I am so sorry. I mean, I'm repenting to my wife here 45 years later because I didn't know a lot of things when it came to, you know, how to relate to, to, to women and how to care for them and all that. Like, I didn't propose very well. I didn't propose well at all, okay? And, and I'm sorry. Honey, I am sorry. I mean, man, if I had it to do all over again, I'd have done her up, you know? When my firstborn son decided to propose to Rachel, he said, Dad, I want you to take me up in the airplane, and I want to propose to my, you know, to Rachel, And I said, sure, you know, this is really outside of my thinking, but hallelujah, let's do it. So he went out and made these big styrofoam letters in a cornfield or bean field, I think it was. It says, will you marry me? Now, we had to make a couple spins around before she actually seen the message, but by golly, we got there. And I'm telling you what, it was kumbaya on the back seat of that plane, hallelujah. Are you listening to me? Well, I didn't do that. I mean, you know, I just didn't do that because I didn't know any better. I'd never been taught. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. But I'm, I'm, I'm making up for lost time. Are you listening to me? Surrendering your heart to him fully. You got problems in your life? Ask yourself. Because sometimes, you know, we think we have, but we haven't Fully surrendered huh you know, it's kind of easy to deceive your heart, your own heart find the right place yeah i mean you know uh and then people say well you know this preacher he tells me you know that if i you know do this and god will fix everything well i'm still in the mess i've been in you know blah 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 well let me ask you a question is that god's fault is it the preacher's fault everybody say is it the preacher's fault Thank you. Praise the Lord. It's not his fault. Hallelujah. Because here's the thing I know, that when we are genuine and authentic with God, things happen. 
Are you listening to me? Things change. Hallelujah. And that's the way he wants it for everyone. So that's number one, you know, surrendering to him fully. Number two, you know, discovering what it is that he's promised through his word. Let me make this statement to you and see if you can get your head wrapped around it. But everything, everybody say everything. Everything Everything that relates to your success will be found in what you know about the Word of God. So if you want to talk about interpersonal relationships and how to act and behave and whatever, success in that area is based upon what you know uh, from the Word. If it's, you know, uh, your well-being, resources, things of that nature, it will all be based upon what it is that you know from the Word. Because the Bible is an instruction manual for life, and it covers it all. It covers how to raise your kids. It talks about how children are to behave to their parents. It talks about how spouses, husbands, and wives are to treat one another, all those different kinds of things. Now, if you, if you mix in some of the world, you know, and get a little bit of their ideologies and some of their junk and whatever, man, you can mess it up. Case in point. You know, the Bible makes it clear that the husband is the head of the home, the leader, not a dictator, but he's responsible. Maybe that's a better way to define that role as a leader, that I am responsible, you know, and and, um, and that the the, the wife is, um, the Bible, the King James uses the word submit, you know, they, people get all jacked up about it, especially these days you know, and um, uh, deference. Can we use that word? To defer. You know, if I have my wife's interest at heart, and this is one thing the late Fred Price, he made this statement about marriage relationships, and he just, he made it, it's powerful. He said, he said, if I'm doing what it is that God wants me to do in relating to my wife and what it is that we're you know, trying to accomplish, then my wife will have no problem deferring to me in order for that to uh, come about. Does that make sense to you? He said it a lot simpler than that. But the thing about it is, is that, you know, we're in this together, you know, in a husband-wife relationship. Many people, they're in, they're in married relationships, but they're, they're, not, they're not in it together. I mean, they are, but they aren't. You know, one's going this way, one's going the other way. That's not the kind of life that Jesus came to give us. This is kind of an interesting message this morning, isn't it? Praise the Lord. You say, you said that this was all going to get better. Is is that come here anytime soon? Yeah, it sure does. Amen. Sometimes you got (laughs) to get the corn knife out and go through the weeds in order to get to where it is you want to go, right? Huh? Hallelujah. <clears throat> so, everything relating to your success is based on what you know from the Word of God. Um, now, here's the other, the number three. We're getting to three. And that is to forsake. Everybody say forsake. forsake. Yeah, forsake all the junk. You know? And walk down the path that he's chosen for you. You know, I said, I shared it, but I can only speak from my own experience. You know, when I got born again, he's dwelling on the inside of me, and he's talking to me. Right. And he says, you can't hang out with these, your, your former friends, and have success. Social things overthrow more people than you can ever imagine. What are people going to to think. There's sometimes, and I'll qualify this, but there are sometimes in life when it comes to your relationship with God, you don't care what people think because you are going to be rubbing the cat the wrong way. You understand what I mean? Okay. It's just the way it is. Well, you know, then I won't be accepted in my community or I won't be accepted amongst my friends. Well, you know what? If they don't love Jesus, you really don't, they're not your friend anyway. Are you with me? But it's a difficult step 
Because all my life, these people were all I knew. So now Jesus is saying, I got a different path for you. Will you forsake this and follow this? And thank God I was smart enough to say yes. I, didn't, I couldn't even do that on my own. Are you with me? But I chose a different path. And sure enough, I mean, man, they disappeared. They were gone. Are you listening to me? You know, a lot of times, you know, in the world today, we've got Christians. You know, they got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And they can't figure out how come things, you know, how come you can't just be happy, you know, or whatever, you know, their deal is. Well, dude, you know, God is a jealous God. And he's not sharing you with the world, or at least he doesn't want to. Huh? You might be surprised how life could plane out if you were willing. And, that, and that's, you know, at the end of the day, dude, come on, let's, let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. You know, you're the one that is deciding how this thing's going to go down. You know? Well, I just don't think you have to do that. Well, then carry on. You know? Carry on my wayward son. You know, whatever. Do whatever you want. <clears throat> I don't know where it came from, honey. <laughs> you say, preacher, why are you telling us this? Because I want God's best for your life. And I mean, when you have life and life more abundant, not to mention the fact, if you have life and life more abundant, it makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Does away with the problems. Forsake all the junk. Walk down the path he's chosen. Amen? Amen? It's the way to go, man. It's where freedom is. Amen. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me re-emphasize this. Um, some of those decisions, they're not easy. Okay? You know? Get, get rid of your flaky, funky friends, you know. Um, I share this story. I've shared it before, but it, it works. You know, if you will listen to your heart, God will tell you what you need to do. After I got saved, I'm in a bar. I've shared this story before. But I'm sitting in a bar, and I go to the bar all the time. I mean, this is, my, this is where my homies are. I mean, this is what we do. We play flag football and then we go drink beer till it's time to go home because we need to go home so we can go to sleep because we've got to go to work. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm in this bar, but now I'm saved. You say, can saved people be in a bar? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was thoroughly saved. I hadn't been sanctified yet, but I was saved. And I'm in this bar sitting at a stool at the, at the bar with a friend of mine. And um, I turn around, and I look out into this dark, smoke-filled room. Now, you got to understand, I never had a thought like this in my life. But the thought came to me, you don't belong here. And I verbally said it out of my mouth. I remember. I said, I don't, I don't belong here. But, you know, now I'm wrestling in my brain. Why don't, why don't I belong here? I mean, you know, because I'm just a, a new Christian. I don't know anything about all of this, but I knew that that was not where I belong. Now, you know, people uh, these days, you know, they'll argue the point and um, say, well, you know, it's all right to have a beer once in a while or whatever. Is, is a beer going to send you to, uh, to hell? Probably not. That's not the point. It's the lifestyle and everything else that goes along with it. Huh? And my Bible says to avoid all appearance of evil. Yeah, but you know, in the, in the, in the Bible, the Bible says they drink wine, you know, and they all did, you know. And, and people, you know, you can do whatever you want, dude. I don't care. But I'm telling you that what I know is that that whole thing is not conducive to success 
as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can do whatever you want with it, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever you want. So when I heard that on the inside of me, and I said, I don't belong here. You know, I just pushed all my beers over to this guy, which was really unusual, and said, here you go, you can have these. And I walked out the door and never went back. Why? Because he said, I don't belong there. We're talking about your willingness to uh, forsake whatever it is. And and here's the thing about it is, is, you know, don't let the devil lie to you. Because that's what it is. Has God really said, you know, that you can't really partake of the trees of the garden? She says, well, no, no. He said, we can, we can partake of all the trees of the garden. It's just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, uh, he said we're, not, we're not to touch it lest we die. And then he flat out lies to her and just says, you won't die. The devil tells people that all the time. He said, you won't die. You won't destroy your life. You won't ruin your life, you know, by doing this or that or the other. But you know what? That's exactly what they do. Sin has pleasure for a season, but I tell you what, at some point, the chickens come home to roost. Are you with me? Hallelujah. So we're not talking about religion here. We're talking about a relationship with God. You know, and sometimes people, they, get, they, they kind of mix in their goofed up ide- uh, ideologies, you know, a little, little re- religion and a little of this and a little of that and a little of the other. That's why God gave us his word, to renew our minds, straighten out our thinking, and get on the right course so that we can enjoy the life that he has come to give us. Hallelujah. Now, are you doing all right or are you, are you choking? Okay. Because this pattern is all over in the Bible. And the pattern I'm talking about is is how that God comes with a desire to fix broken lives and broken, well, lives, people. And people are broken, you know? And and, um, if we had time, I'm not going to make this. Hang on a second. We're having a conversation on what to do next. (laughs) Mary says, go for it. Well, I want to go for it where he wants to go, you know, not what I want to do. Is that all right with you? Okay, so we're having a little bit of an argument here. I'm just working on it. (laughs) Surrender, yeah, surrender. I'm going to give you the, the, the whatever kind of thing. You need to go home and read Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah is the one who rebuilt the wall. Remember that? The wall of Jerusalem. And the reason that the wall was broken down was because of sin, the sin of Israel, the sin of God's people. And Jeremiah prophesied that 70 years of slavery, basically, had been determined because of their sin that they would be led away into Babylon, you know, for all of these years. Well, Nehemiah is on the backside of all of that. In other words, the 70 years has passed. And like others, he had read the scriptures and he knew that it was time for God to be merciful and to rebuild. How many of you know God wants to be merciful? And he wants to rebuild. And he wants to fix things. Zerubbabel went down to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple, but all of the walls and everything were still in you know, ruin and different things of that nature. So Nehemiah then became this wall builder. Hallelujah. And it, it's a wonderful story. You ought to read it. <laughs> I don't have time to tell it to you, but... And there's so many wonderful things in that. And how that relates to what we're talking about here today is, is that when he had the grace and the favor of God on his life, just like you do, I said you do, just like he had his grace on his life to do what he did, you have his grace on your life to do what you need to do. Amen? But when he went to that city, he wept because it was a mess. But God, you know, used a bunch of people and said, here's what God's put in my heart. And they said, let us rise and build. And away they went. What am I saying to you? You can do the same thing. (coughs) Amen. 
You can rise and build. Now, here's the thing you need, just a little my little outline here, but when he started doing it, or I mean, when he started in this direction, the first thing his enemies did was mock him. You know? They just mocked him. They said, these Jews, dude, they couldn't do anything if their life depended on it. You know, this will be a deal. Watch this. Well, you know what? They got themselves together. They developed a strategy, and they started putting this place together. And then the word came to uh, Tobiah and Sanballat and a few of the rest of their enemies saying, you know what? They're getting, they're getting something done down there. Well, now all of a sudden they're ticked, you know. And so the next move, and why am I saying this? Because, you know, the devil will mock you. Yeah, you'll never get out of what it is that you're doing. You've always been this way. It'll never change. He's a liar. You start building, praise God, and it'll change. Next thing that happens with this guy is they, they start to threaten him. You know, and they sent letters to put him in fear, all different kinds of stuff, you know, to try to get him to stop doing what he was doing. One time they they gave him an invitation, said, we need to meet together and we need to meet down here in the valley of Oh No. Listen, if the valley's name is Oh No, you don't want to go there. Huh? It's like, oh no, you don't. But they, you know, they, they meant evil for him. He says, man, I can't, I can't stop. Uh, we're doing a great work. So they threatened him. And not only that, but then they said, you know, if you don't do this, we're going to go back to the king and we're going to say that you're conspiring against him to become your own king. So they developed this conspiracy, you know, to try to threaten him and to get him to stop. Well, he knew better than that, praise God, and he just kept on going. I said, God wants you to keep on going. Amen. So then when they, they uh, uh, so they, they mocked him, they threatened him, what else did they do? They what? Oh, I thought you were preaching to me. Okay. Oh, <clears throat> they, they started to do things to try to distract him. They even sent some goofed up priest that was supposed to be, you know, godly, who wasn't down there, you know, to deceive him. Probably you could include deception there too, but really to distract. You know, when when you set out on these things, you know, you're going to rebuild your marriage. You're going to, you know, rebuild your home. You're going to take back what the devil has done, you know, as far as your kids are concerned, or you're going to do something about, you know, the death that you're dealing with or the chronic illnesses or whatever. You know, there's going to be distractions. The devil loves to try to get people off you know, on another road. Jairus, you know, he asked Jesus to come and heal his daughter. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm in it. I'm there. I'm going. And the word came back and said, don't trouble the master any further. He's dead. Jesus turned to that guy and said, you talk about a distraction. And Jesus turned to that guy and says, don't be afraid. Only believe. You'd be surprised how often, if you read the gospel sometimes, Look at how many times Jesus had to get rid of all the doubt and unbelief before he could do what he wanted to do. He took that one guy out of the city. He let him out of the city and healed him. There was different, and this deal with Jairus, you know, when they got to his house, the Bible says they laughed him to scorn. They were so angry at Jesus that he would make the statement that the damsel isn't dead, she's just sleeping, you know? So what did he do? Put them out. You know, there were different times when Jesus went uh, to do the miraculous, and the only three that he took were Peter, James, and John. He says, yeah, yeah, he was a people, you know, they were all a bunch of people pleasers, and, you know, Jesus just had preference over them. No, he took them because they believed God, and the rest of them didn't. When you're, when you're believing God, you don't want people around you telling you 95 reasons why it's not true and it won't work. Huh? And, and, and religious people are the worst. You know? Whew. Don't get started, Mikey. You'll get in trouble. You want people that will believe God. You know? So they threatened him, you know. They tried to distract him. They got him. But I tell you what, they built that wall in 52 days. That's supernatural in and of itself. Amen. And a lot of other things. He said, the hand of my God is a, was upon us. Isn't that good? 
I tell you, the hand of God's on you. The hand of God is on your life. The hand of God is purposes and what it is that he wants to do for you or on your life. Hallelujah. You know, he wants to lift the burden of loss. Glory to God. He wants you to be blessed coming in and going out. He wants you to enjoy everything that heaven has for you as a child of God, as a person of God. Think about the woman with the issue of blood. Okay? Here's a woman. The Bible says when she heard of Jesus, now you know her condition. I mean, hopeless. Would you agree? She had no hope in this situation. Maybe you're looking at your circumstance. You're saying there's no hope. There is hope. He is the God of hope. Hallelujah. There is hope. You know, Abraham, who against hope, believed on in hope that he would become the father of many nations. You know, when you're weary, when you're tired, when it looks like nothing's changing, when it looks like it's never going to turn around, I'm telling you what, praise God, God can show up in that circumstance and he can bring his blessing into your life. Can you say amen? amen. You know? And so, so as you deal with these kinds of things, and I'm coming to a close, hallelujah, but the woman with the issue of blood had no hope. And yet this woman said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. That was her faith. She heard that Jesus had virtue coming from him. She had a word. She had a promise. She knew that it was true, and she went after it. Are you listening to me? And thank God she came in the press behind. Don't you think that's a beautiful imagery of the difficulty and challenges sometimes we face in order to get where it is that God wants us to go so that we can enjoy the blessing of God? Thank God she didn't look at the crowd and say, hey, no way I'm getting through that. No, man. <coughs> she came in the press behind. Got up there and grabbed his, the hem of his garment and virtue came out of his body and healed that woman. Changed her life forever. You know, God can change your life forever. You know, if you'll believe him. How many of you believe him? Praise God. I mean, you know, maybe you got a financial thing going on right now. I'm telling you what, God can do some supernatural things if we'll trust him. He said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said, fear not. Sometimes we're bound by fear. Are you with me? Fear keeps people from doing a lot of things. Well, if I go to church, you know, everybody will be mad at me. My family will be mad at me. Praise God. You got to get a bunch of sirens, horns, lights, uh, banners. Drive by their house. Put a sign on it. Say, I'm going to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just so they know. He said, fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed or discouraged because I am your God. This is what, that we're talking about God's promises for you in your life. He said, I will strengthen you, I will help you. Y'all need help this morning? He said, I'll help you. Praise God. He said, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Jeremiah 30 and 17 says, for I will restore health to you. You know, if you've had chronic situations going on in your life, and he said, and I will heal you of your wounds. Another one, the scripture says, you know, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who or what can be against us? Now listen, he that spared not his own son, but freely gave him as a sacrifice for mankind. How shall he not with him also freely give you all things? God need in your life? God wants to meet it. You got something that God wants, you know, that you need God to intervene and do something with? He can do it. You say, yeah, but I've been through all this all over. Hey, listen, forget about that. And let's talk about where we are right here right now and what God can do. Because remember, he said, I came that you might have life and have it how? More abundantly. So, let's just have it. Why don't you stand with me, if you would, please. Praise God. I want to challenge you this morning. Praise God to believe with me for whatever it is that may be going on in your life right now. Challenges that you may be having or, you know, trouble, uh, adversity, hopelessness, uh, pain or suffering, anything. 
I'm telling you what, God wants to, and here's, here's what you need to understand, you guys. Listen, deliverance or being set free or having answers to your prayer starts with what you believe in here, okay? And if we can get you to believe God, then whatever it is that's going on out here will change. Amen? You know, when I said, God, I don't know if you're out there, but if you are coming to my heart, I mean, there wasn't any immediate, you know, bombs bursting and, you know, all this and that and the other. But I'm telling you what, praise God, something started because I chose to believe. And the same thing's true in your life. Are you listening to me? Let's pray together. Hallelujah. Close your eyes. Maybe lift one hand toward heaven. Say this with me. Father, you are the source of my life. As I come to you today, I surrender all so that your will can be manifested in my life. I believe you, Father, and every promise you've made to make me who you want me to be. I'm willing, Lord, I'm obedient, Lord, to do what you want me to do. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for every person right here, right now. And I'm asking you, Father God, by the Spirit of God to speak to their hearts about the rocky roads or the bumpy problems or the whatever it is that's going on in their lives, God. And I want to ask you, Father God, to meet them right here in this house. If they're watching by internet, I pray, God, that you'll meet them wherever they are, whether they're in their bedroom, their living room, or wherever. Speak to their heart, Father, about what you want to do in their lives. Hallelujah. Bring about the, pro- the possibilities that heaven has for them. While your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. You know, if there's something in your life that you want to see a turnaround and a change with, whatever it is, I want to give you an opportunity to come to this altar this morning, and I want you to present yourself and your situation to him. I can't fix anything, but I tell you what, he can. And by your coming, you're acknowledging your need, and you're saying, God, I'm opening my heart to you. I'm surrendering to your purpose. Come right now, whoever you may be. Just come right from wherever it is that you're standing, and just make your way to the front right here. Praise God. If you feel like you want to kneel, go ahead and kneel, you know, before the Lord, because it is before him that you're coming. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.